tell me when you are. Okay, so we have the recording in progress. That's good. So welcome to day two. Um, just a quick recap. Yesterday, we have started it, um, to get our hands dirty and um, run the multi no <laughs> Megatron training um, without really knowing the underlying um, uh, mechanism. So today, we're going to go through that exact mechanism. Uh, we will start by uh, making sure that uh, the Jupyter Notebook environment is accessible to everyone. So um, we are a little bit late, but um, we will check on that. And then we will talk about uh, compute, as in, you know, estimated the days or hours needed before you can request for compute resources. And then we will go through the labs. There will be, um, there will be a profiling champion. Um, he will join us later. And um, we will go through the Megatron default workflow. As you can see, there are six labs and one challenge. And the challenge is about profiling. And then we will discuss, um, oh, by the way, in that session of the profiling, uh, this uh, EMEA profiling champion, he will stay with us until uh, we are all good. And, and then afterwards, we will have uh, the discussion of what's going to happen next day. So today, again, we're just going to run through the Megatron default workflow. Tomorrow, we're going to customize it to Swedish. Next, yeah. So um, this is the speaker for today. Um, he will join us later. His name is Robert Dietrich, and he is the Insight Profiling Champion. In fact, he's the go-to person in the entire EMEA who actually know Insight inside out. Insight will be the tool set that we will be using for the profiling. So the first thing is this, uh, the environment setup, uh, we will <laughs> go through that momentarily when I run through this uh, quick, quickly. So basically, uh, in fact, this should be uh, the other way around, but we will uh, acquire the data set because we are not really allowed to give you any data set. So any data set we'll be using in any of the lab will be toy data. Um, we will be using web scraping. Um, th this one uh, we will be going through first, uh, first and then second, and then we will do the pre-processing to MMAP format. We will understand how, uh, because Megatron is a very, uh, to train very big, model. So for, to train very big model, you need very big data. Very big data of gigabytes or terabytes, it needs to have efficient data loading mechanism, which is the reason why we need to convert it to MMAP format. And you will uh, have a lab about that. Then we will verify what is necessary in order to be compliant to the GPT-2BP tokenizer. OK, then we will be uh, running the profiling because Again, yesterday we have heard from Dai and Bruno about the uh, superpod architecture. They allow you to have um, high-speed interconnection like MV Link and MV Switch, as well as InfiniBand. They're connecting the DGX server. And, and these needs to be utilized properly, which is why we will introduce you uh, about profiling. OK. So for everyone <laughs> who has not uh, yet uh, done that, could you make your way to, again, uh, master document? I'm going to, uh, I think it's this one, yes. This is the master document. Go to the Accessing Jupyter Lab, right click it, open the link. It will show you this one. And uh, it will walk you through step by step, however, if you also have the, um, if you also would like to see exactly uh, how to do this in a video recording way, I have posted a um, yesterday evening. I have posted a um, video here. So if you click on that, it will walk you through how to do it exactly. Uh, no, no, no. That's the NumPy one. Uh, I think it's a binary format in order to speed up. And you will see that in the lab, Jonas. OK. So we are going to, since the first uh, lab, uh, before we actually do, we're going to switch this, in fact. We're going to do the data fetching, which is this one. We, we would do that via wave scraping. I, I know that some of you guys have access to abundance of data from Corby Lab. Uh, not every one of us has that luxury. So um, yes, NumPy MMAP format, yes. So um, what, 
what I'm uh, trying to say is that um, this particular lab is designed for is designed for uh, making uh, the wave scraping easier, but it is only done in the uh, NVIDIA NV block uh, URL. So, so the first thing you do is that you you collect links. So you, you, you start with the URL, then you collect, like, collect links, and you are going to uh, using request and respond to the client server architecture in order to actually get the web page and store it on disk in HTML format. Once you have done that, uh, <coughs> I will answer those questions later. So once you have done that, you will parse those save the disk HTML format web pages you will parse those HTML web pages and get the raw text out of it. So we will, we will do this for 70 web pages of the MV block, NVIDIA blocks posts, and then we'll, we will use it in a consecutive labs. So it's very important you go through the lab sequentially. And if, um, if for those of you who uh, wanted to use web scraping for other website, you must adopt it to uh, the website patterns because you know when you um, when you do the scraping and parse the content, you need to look into the uh, web pages HTML tags and their hierarchical structure in order to fetch the text, the correct text. Otherwise, you need to clean it afterwards as well. So that's what we're gonna do first. So. Shall we go to the thing link client? I hope everyone already have an access. Um, give me a second, I'm logging in. F8, uncheck full screen. So, Again, uh, everyone need to cd into their own user directory. Uh, I think, uh, so we're gonna do Slurn Interactive Run. I tried and I could not, um, sorry, is there any questions? Yes, yes, I know. Um, well, we always <laughs> we always modified the schedule um, according to um, according to the the courses. So instead of uh, uh, the, the web page is not always updated, so I updated myself. And this, uh, by the way, this bootcamp is exclusive. It's the first of its kind. It's because that we never have done it before. So I created the content in order to serve the Swedish community. In fact, so um, anything uh, in the end of the course that that there's a survey on the master document, and please uh, do give feedback so that I can you know improve myself for the for the next time. Okay, so uh, if there's any questions that do, uh, do ask it now, otherwise I will go through the Jupyter Notebook process and then we're going to go through the lab. So this is how you uh, fetch the interactive. Um, so now you can see that you have the node 057. And then we will export, where's my export? So as I said, that when you, um, when you are in this, you need to make sure that you are in the current directory where you have the uh, PyTorch, this file, PyTorch underscore 21.03.sif file. This is necessary to run Singularity. But before we run Singularity, this you have to do that in that sequence. And then you export the Singularity byte months. This will make your current directory visible to, to the running container of Singularity. So when you run Singularity, this particular path and all of its subdirectory will be visible. Yours will be different. Yours should be project, uh, Megatron Bootcamp users and your username, wherever that is, either asset or here, that where you can directly see when you do ls this particular file. Cool. And then afterwards, we're going to run, uh, we're going to run singularity. So this is the singularity command. Copy, paste. Then you can see the singularity prompt happened here. Now, for those of you who already copy over your certificate, 
again, the certificate has to be, uh, when you copy over the certificate, it needs to be under the place, exact the same directory where you have the singularity SIF, uh, um, sorry, you have the PyTorch 2103 SIF file. It has to be the same directory where it's visible. Okay, otherwise you have to give the absolute path to that. Now you have two things to do. One is that you need to, you need to set your password. Either that you set the password uh, directly via using Jupyter. This is the command. Uh, where is it? Jupyter Notebook Password. And then you enter the password twice. You can do it right now when you under the singularity prompt. Or that you could do this after, um, after you have uh, run it and then come back to redo it. If you, if, you, if you already set it, then you don't need to go through this process. This process is one time only. Okay, so afterwards, we are going to do the Jupyter Lab when we are under the singularity problem. So again, so you can see, now my singularity can still see everything. It's because I have done the by month. For, for this, you need to, again, either give the absolute pass to your certificate, and then the port, you have to look for the port in your master document when you scroll down to the link to the port allocation and find the port. Okay, so now that is done, you enter it, and momentarily you should see that screen of, um, why is it taking so long? So this is the screen you should be seeing. Okay, so from that point onwards, again, we go back and memorizing which node it is, it's node 057. So we have to run the Firefox node. So history is my friend. So I have this one already. So I'm just going to paste it here. Yes, yes. This will call out. Uh, well, uh, you guys should not see this one directly, but um, you should see the the one that's over here. In the end, advanced. Accept the risk and continued. I know that that warning sign is very disturbing, but you know just the. Uh, bear with that. <laughs> then you'll go to the screen, which is what am I seeing right now, and you enter the password you have set. You can save it, but I don't want to save it. Then you navigate it into, uh, you navigate it into GP, GPU Bootcamp, AI, Megatron, English, Python, start here. When you are here, you're ready to go. The things that you needed to do is to check the environment. So again, you can use NVIDIA SMI and you will see you have two A100 GPU. And that's every one of us will get two A100 GPU, 40 gigabyte. And you need to make sure that those uh, uh, verified that you know NVLink is active. It should look something like this. And the ANSYS, which is the profiling tool we're gonna use is right here, is okay. Then you need to make all of the, um, uh, the placeholder for the data set. Yes, 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 correct. And then in today's lab, uh, we're gonna go through lab one. So there are six of them. We're going to go through them sequentially. It's very important you go through them sequentially because each and every one of them will give you the necessary asset you need for the next step. Now, of course, I have a, a backup uh, things uh, in, in the when you untar the asset, but don't do that. Just go through this sequentially. So when you when you do um, go through this sequentially, you should be able to uh, produce the data as well as the uh, GPT tokenizers um, corresponding files, as well as all of the things you needed in order to run Megatron and profiling it. OK, so if you click this, you will go to the first lab. So that's what we're going to do. So, yeah, let's do that. Uh, you can stop recording now, Mozilla. Thank you. It is recording. Uh, okay, but I mean, we are going to the. Oh, lab it now, stopped the so. recording. Sorry. Did you yeah. say it stopped? Oh, stop, yes. Sorry. Okay.
Yeah, so um, I hope that you guys actually have uh, uh, get to at least the, the first lab and the Jupyter Notebook problem is solved. I hope that. And if that's not the case, uh, please go to um, another room, I think room six, uh, where we will specifically be uh, going through like if you have any more questions. And then if you can, Mosagan, ask Johan to join that channel, uh, that breakout room, room six afterwards, and so that we can um, help you to, uh, how do you say, accelerate it so it doesn't uh, hinder your progress. Okay, so um, let's now go back to uh, okay, I haven't shared my screen. Uh, let's share my screen and see. I know that we don't have enough time uh, to actually go through the first one, but um, now that's after you have acquiring the data. Um, if you haven't finished that, you will have the time to finish that later. So we are going to talk about estimated time need for compute. Let me make it full screen. So Mosakan, uh, you can see my full screen. Yes, yes. Okay, so we go a little bit backwards. So we get the data first. And um, usually that's what happened. You have acquired data set and you make sure that you got enough data set in order to train GPT-3 models, right? And the thing is that, you know, um, usually the data, data set um, is not usually measured in gigabyte or terabytes in that sense with regard to this particular estimation, it's measured in tokens. So basically, you want to get your data size as least at least billions of tokens. So um, in the previous day, the first day, I created toy data, like you know, synthetically created it, and then you know, duplicated uh, with uh, some kind of modification in order to get to billions of data for you to train that um, multi-node GPT-3 models. However, as you can see. As you grow your model, these three has to grow uh, at the same time. So if you grow your model size, you need to grow your data size. The compute in that sense is easier to um, estimate. So let's say if we have a set data size, you will, you will see that in the lab and you have a set target GPT-3 uh, model size uh, in mind and the, the model size is in this kind of format, then what you wanted to do is that you wanted to estimate it. If I increased the GPUs that I can have access to, what would be the hours or days needed in order to do an end-to-end -end training run? Okay. So, <coughs> sorry. You guys will have access to this uh, Jupyter notebook, which you can modify uh, as you see fit, of course. And you will um, go through this in order to check that if I fixed uh, the data size, and in this, uh, in this case is 3 billion of tokens. Again, and this is cleaned data size. So in day three, we will talk about how to clean the data, but now let's just accept that the data is cleaned. And then if you said that if, if we have 3 billion of tokens, and then we set the target uh, of the GPT model of the parameter size in this kind of format, what would be the days um, days or hours needed converted to days in order to do an end-to-end -end training run? And Megatron, in that sense, will require you to, um, so uh, as, the, as, the, as the model size grow, and then you need to get more of GPUs. Megatron is such a framework that allow you to train up to uh, 1 trillion of parameters with that say 3072 GPU, but we don't have access to that much of a GPU today. And then in that notebook, it is synthetically created it, which means that um, you will not need it to actually go through this. You, this is just an estimation. So it's in fact a formula that's helping you to do this. So if we're going backwards to see this, you need a few ingredients. You need to know what's your data size measure in numbers of tokens. You need to know how many GPUs you're having at your disposal. So that's the request you need to make to Basilius uh, Cluster Admin. So depending on the number of GPU that you're having, and then you, then you will need the teraflop calculation. The teraflop calculation has a formula itself and different framework has different way to calculate it, but Megatron has its way of calculating it and it's embedded in the paper. 
But for your conveniences, we simply extracted it from this, this particular achieved teraflopper GPU here. Once you have these ingredients, you are able to make estimations. So now, uh, if we go to the, uh, the lab, because that was what we're going to do after you have done the wave scraping, the second thing you are going to do is to estimate it, the time needed for an end-to-end -end computation. So we assume that we actually get our data, actually, uh, that we have to finish that. But if we once we get our data, you then should have, uh, I get kicked out, so I have to redo this. Uh, Uh, so here, huh? Something is happening. I, am I the yeah. only one having trouble with thin link? It just stops. Uh, yeah, it's the same for me. processes. Yes. Uh, I, when when that happens, uh, I usually do this, and that's hope they will happen. Otherwise, uh, uh, that's hope they will fix it. So I just close it and I restart the thin link. It is the uh, usually it's the connection between your computer. Right. No, this is different because it, it's it won't start processes processes within ThinLink even if I restart it. Uh -huh. oh, anyway, so. But, and, and that that's I'll, trying I'll, get. I'll, I'll just do it in the background and and you continue. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, um, but yeah, we do need to try and fix that. I don't know why. It does that. Now I, I don't have, even have a. Uh, Johan is actually on the Zoom. So uh, if, if there was something that he can help, he can just help out now. Uh huh. Uh, it would be great because I think you can see there's thinking. I think it is the, there's a, a process, either process or networking issue. You can think it's thinking. So that means that my, uh, even my user interface is not even fully loaded. So. Okay, but anyways, um, let's look at uh, the backup over here then. Uh, Jupyter Notebook, estimated compute days needed. Uh, you can also navigate it to there directly. So um, within this, you will have you will have access to this uh, Jupyter notebook once that this problem is solved. Uh, I probably will need, um, Mosakan, can you communicate with uh, Johan and see that if you, he could jump into uh, breakout room six. Yeah, he's so on can... the Zoom now, so I'll move him to the breakout room. He is actually here on the Zoom oh, online. Hi. Yeah, yeah. hi. So Johan, maybe you can help us out of like this uh, problem why uh, I don't see anything and, and it's still thinking. So, um, but you have started Firefox, right? Or what, what's the nature of the problem? I don't, uh, please so, describe so, it. So uh, usually when you have this uh, thing link user interface, you have this, uh, uh, this little toolbar where you can open new terminals, they disappeared. And then I cannot do anything now because it's syncing. As you can see, there is a circle. Um, so I cannot do anything, uh, open new terminals or anything. All right. So um, uh, it's a bit hard for me to debug uh, yeah. because yeah. it works. I have a session, a thin link session live now. I, I, I don't get any problems. So it's hard for me to debug. I can't see that you've done anything particularly wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, but but many people are experiencing some sort of problem with the, but the thing is you're sharing your screen. Yes, I am. Um, uh, if I stop sharing, would it help? I or, wouldn't or, know, think, but uh, there are no. things obviously that you can check. Okay. Uh, what, what worked for me was, was logging out, logging in again, and then there's a checkbox that sort of you uh, close your existing session. So please, that worked please. For me. So, mm -hmm. uh, Senodia, uh, mm -hmm. do it by logging out with, by the little running green man on the menu. Yeah, I am trying to do that, but I cannot even... Um, then try I with F8 and, and, and the existing session. Uh, yeah, I think you should be able to do that at least. Disconnect session. Yeah. 
Okay, let me re, re, re enter and see if it fixed the issue. F8. No, it is not. Uh, Okay, but we have to solve it some uh, somehow. In I will I will open up another uh, one. I have to start my own station, but uh, let me do that later. I would say that we need to solve this uh, for all of the attendees, including myself, in order to be able to continue. Right. I don't know how to even stop this uh, when it's uh, thinking and then it doesn't allow me to to break right. <laughs> break the sessions. Yeah. Right. Could, could you do, sorry for, for trying to do IT support, but uh, could, could you Thank do that you. again? Could, yes. Could, could you disconnect? Yeah. And then log in again uh, or, or start thin, thin link again. There's a checkbox that says end existing session. Mm -hmm. Check that one. Thank you, Martin. That, that worked for me at least. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we just wait. <laughs> just <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, so um, uh, apparently there's another way. Um, so thank you guys uh, for the IT support. <laughs> okay, so now I have to um, Go in there again, uh, guest user. Uh, I heard that we have to use the day two flag. Isn't it right, uh, Johan? We have so, to add this. Yes, so that reservation. Uh, otherwise, you will get end up in the in the regular uh, uh, queue. Uh, and uh, while this is certainly possible, it's not a high load on the cluster currently, but it will, uh, uh, so yeah, just use it. So you use the resources that are reserved for you. And there will be so, no clashes with other users. So, so uh, everyone, uh, you, before you do an interactive run, so the, what it does is that it requests it for two GPUs and then it uh, makes sure that uh, it is full in the reserved one, as Johan said, that we will actually get it. So now you can, uh, I am still not access denied. Uh, okay, because I don't oh, belong to that one. No, you sorry. don't belong to that group. So, so forget about that for, you, for your examples. But, yeah, but the, yeah, users, sorry. Uh, the, uh, the course attendants should, should use that uh, reservation. Yes, yes, I have a different one, as you guys can see. Yeah. Uh, okay, so after that, we are going to do export. Export, where's my export? Ah, okay, I'm just gonna do history. So <clears throat> you guys should have a different one. Uh, you can also do Control R, mm. and then type uh, some uh, some string which matches what you want you're looking for. Uh huh. Uh, but now I have it running, so I just need singularity. Yep. Uh, Control, Control R, R singularity. Yes. Uh, now I just need this one. Then I'm done. Open up another one over here. Uh, which one is it? I think it's 57, yes. Uh, control R. Fox. Uh, yes, it was in the uh, pit, uh, it was in the general. Okay, so when you re encounter this uh, problem, 
what you do is that you stop it and go back here, control C, yes, and then you do Jupyter dash notebook password. You reset the password. And then you redo this. So that will solve the problem. Now that uh, we are here, and then we have done, if we have done that, we can move on to this one. When we are in here, as you can see, it is provided for you. Uh, work reliably. Yes, it does. Uh, uh, so. As you guys can see, I'm going to make it bigger. So um, it's much more easier to see. So it is provided for you here. So you can look for clues. Again, uh, you will need this one in order to uh, feed it in into, into the, um, the lab. So basically, it is this one is extracted from the paper. We have the equation right here of how you do time estimation. And that's from this paper. For this, we extracted the two scenarios this particular screenshot of that papers. So basically, we will have 300 billion tokens. We assume that's the data size we have, the clean data. We assume we want to tra train 175 billion GPT-3 models. We assume we have 1,024 GPUs. And then this one is lookup from this, OK? So this is the second scenario, and then you will see that we, we, we should observe around 34 days. And for this scenario, we should observe for 84 days. We simply wrap this particular equations into a Python script right here for your convenience. And then we convert it to days. So that's what this one will look like. So this is sanity check. And in this notebook, you should um, fill in according to this exercise. What would be the numbers here? In order to calculate it, your own um, days or hours estimated for your own GPT-3 run. So let's head to this lab. And if you haven't finished the, the, the website scraping, you probably need to finish that one first. Cool. So I'm going to uh, jump into room six together with Johan. If you have any technical issues, uh, we hopefully will be able to solve it there. OK? I, I uh, have a mm -hmm. question, Snowda. Yes, yes. Um, so if we put in GPT-3 parameters um, for the uh, uh, Bicelius cluster, it's, it will take half a year <laughs> to, to train it, I think. So, so you, you have, um, well, like I said, Basilius, um, uh, Johan can actually correct me if I'm wrong. We have 480 GPUs. And yes, it's, it is true. So in that sense, you might need to <laughs> train a smaller one. Yeah, yeah, okay. I just wanted to double check that, uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, because um, and, uh, it, we, we do have, we do have uh, 3,072 in, uh, our own uh, internal cluster, NVIDIA internal cluster. Yeah. Um, but it, it, super pot, uh, as long as you're bigger, uh, it, it, how do you say, than just one DGX station, uh, and then you follow the super pot architecture, then you are a super pot. <laughs> yeah, even though that you don't have 3000 GPUs, and that's still good enough. Good enough. <laughs> yes. All right, uh, if, you're, if you guys have any questions, um, please do ask me now. Otherwise, uh, we, I will open the breakout room and, and then we, I will jump into room six in order. <coughs> so um, did you guys get the, uh, the number 115.7? Yes? Yes? Yes. Cool. Um, do you mind sharing that to the uh, the solution to the main? Otherwise, I can share my screen and uh, show you the solution. So this is what you need to enter in my screen. Cool. Cool. 
Okay. And <coughs> sorry, just one question. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back to your solution. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, this is here. Yeah, uh, that P, isn't it redundant there? Because when you call your function calculate days needed, you know. It is, it is. I just put it there for just to uh, kind of see to it that if it, you get fooled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have made that joke. It's almost like stupid, uh, but anyways. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's go back. I hope that you guys have, oh. Sorry. I hope that you guys have successfully um, gotten the data and, uh, and have done lab one and lab two. Now that we're going to go through some serious stuff. <laughs> uh, before uh, we do that, um, before we do that, I want to formally thank uh, Xientao because basically I steal a lot of things from him in order to uh, make sure that uh, this presentation um, for how Megatron Core is actually utilizing and chop the matrices into um, uh, tiny pieces uh, and send it to the GPU uh, from him, basically. Yeah, uh, uh, OK. <laughs> and he, he, he is uh, also thanking someone else <laughs> for, for that. So all right, so let's get started. And this is going to be a little bit um, intense. And if in the end of this session, you still have questions, I will put Shen Tao in room six, and uh, he will. He had he wrote two, in fact, I think three or four blocks specifically decipher this. Unfortunately, it is in Chinese, but uh, he will be able to walk you through this um, in that breakout room in case anybody uh, has further questions. Okay, let's get started. This is a little bit um, intense, so I really hope that uh, is going to be okay. <laughs> so. Let's remember why we care of why Megatron, how Megatron is doing this, you know, the core of Megatron. How does Megatron actually chop um, the um, transformer into tiny pieces and then send it to the GPUs? The reason why we care is because of two things. One is that Megatron is the, 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 the open source framework. It, it is open source, so it's allow you to uh, take it and modify as you see fit in order to train up to 1 trillion parameters. And Megatron, again, is based on, it is actually made for um, superpods architecture. Superpod architecture can have up to 3,072 uh, GPUs, as you guys have seen in that Megatron table. And with regard to the teraflop calculation, uh, we, we will be uh, going through the reason why it is important to actually be able to achieve the teraflop, because if we won't be able to do that through profiling, because profiling is our, um, is our kind of baseline in order to check how well is the GPU being utilized, but that will be in the next session. Now let's focus on Megatron Core MPU. We will, in the lab, we will be going through these two particular uh, uh, Python script inside of Megatron. This is Megatron uh, GitHub, Megatron MPU. MPU stands for Megatron Model Parallel Unit, MPU. <coughs> the first thing we need to understand about how to scale is that PyTorch comes with, um, for free, in fact, comes with data parallelism comes for free. However, model parallelism is something a bit more difficult. It is not trivial. So Megatron comes with two model parallelism built in. And if you look around the landscape of NLP, almost anyone who, uh, anyone who is doing a uh, large scale model needs to have model parallelism built in. And Megatron offer that for you as a core. And in fact, uh, Facebook fair scale, as well as um, uh, Microsoft D Speed, they are all using this as the core. So Megatron is the core that's supporting all this. Okay, so it comes with two. One is pipeline parallelism, the other one is tensor parallelism. They are also called interlayer parallelism, and tensor parallelism is also called intra layer parallelism. So if you look over here, if you consider this is layer zero, 
one, two. Pipeline parallelism, chop it vertically, like chop it vertically. So this, if this is the first GPU zero, and this is the second GPU one, the first zero, one, two layer will go to GPU zero. The second uh, three, four, five will go to GPU two. That's pipeline parallelism. The tensor parallelism will chop it horizontally like this. <coughs> These two can be used uh, simultaneously and because they are also going on. Before we jump into exactly how this is chopped, we need to uh, go through some terminologies and it's just a recap. The first thing is NCCO collective operations because they will be used in the consecutive, uh, in the con consecutive slides. All reduce means that you sum over your ranks. And ranks in the sense when um, PyTorch GDP allocated your GPUs, they call it ranks. And it's the same thing with MPI, the same thing with all other things that was using this kind of multi-node training, basically, or multi-GPU multi-node training. They are, that's all they are using. So uh, you will sum it up, and then the result will be sent to each and every of those GPUs. All gather, it looks like this. I mean, it's color coded. So basically, you will gather all of the result from each and every of those GPUs. So this is very important to remember because uh, later on when we do uh, for, uh, uh, forward and backward path, this is the, the one who's going to be used with, with regard to NCCO collective operations. The second thing uh, we needed to actually understand is that, <coughs> sorry, uh, these are uh, activation functions. And, and the one that's normally used uh, is ReLU, but that's not what we're gonna use. So we're gonna skip that, this is ReLU. This is <coughs> ELU and this is JELU. So JELU, the blue one, is the one we're going to use in uh, Megatron. The third thing we need to go through is dropout. This is rather straightforward. So basically it's that uh, by a percentage. So given that if you, this is the number of uh, neural nets uh, nodes that you're having, and you say that I, I, by percentage, I'm gonna drop out half of it, and this is what you do. This is dropout. Okay, now that we have uh, seen through all of those uh, prerequisites, <clears throat> let's break it down. So this is a transformer layer. It consists of self-attention and multi-layer perceptron. We're gonna look at the multi-layer perceptron first because it's the simplest. So we have two, two ways to do this. One is that we can, we have previously, we can either cut our matrices, this is A, we can either cut it uh, horizontally or we can cut it vertically. So that's called row wise or column wise. And this is tensor parallelism. Now, if we do cut it uh, uh, horizontally, uh, we, needed to apply a nonlinear function, which means that we need to make sure that there's a communication point that is CUDA synchronization before we apply this, which is not ideal because we, we want the parallelism to go through. We want the GPUs, um, which has the matrices and then do the multiplication and apply the activa activation function there, if we can. The second approach is that you chop it column wise. In that sense, when you apply the activation function, the non-linearity jello, you do not need that. That is the reason why when it comes to this, uh, the first block of the uh, multi-layer perceptron inside of the transformer, what we do is that, so, so, so that, that's look closely of this diagram. This is the NCC operation, F and G. This is your input tensor. You copy them into two GPUs and you want to multiply them. Of course, you can multiply them however you want. However, you have a nonlinear non uh, activation function right here. So what you want to do is to make sure 
that it stays there, which is the reason why we're gonna cut it column wise. We're gonna look into this in great detail, but that's what we're gonna do. First, we chop A vertically. Again, we are still in tensor model parallel. Tensor model parallel uh, is that you chop the layers like this. So the column parallel is that you chop it vertically and then your input tensor will multiply this, applying JLU directly, which means that you are going to be able to put this in GPU zero, put this in GPU one, and they will become your Y1, Y2. Again, have a look. X is being, this is identity, copy over to GPU zero and GPU one. They're being multiplied because you cut it vertically, column, and then you got your Y1, Y2 right here. So we are, we are now here. Second, we're going to look at this. We, still, we, we now have our Y1, Y2. Now we're gonna chop B horizontally because this one has already been chopped and stay in that GPU and I want it to be stay in that GPU. So we cut B horizontally, Y1, Y2 can directly be multiplied like this and then you got your Z1, Z2. It is still staying in the same GPU as it was before. No communication, uh, intensive communication needed. Then we're gonna sum. So again, Y1, Y2, multiply by the chopping of the B, still staying the same GPU, having Z1, Z2, or reduce sum, get your Z, when it's backwards, it's identity. So far, any questions? Okay, moving on. Self-attention, now we have gone through this part. So self-attention is quite similar. In the self-attention block, you have the value, query, and key. You can still chop it horizontally because softmax is still a nonlinearity function. So again, we do exactly the same thing. We, we copy to the GPUs, we multiply them, because column chopping does not read the synchronization point. Yeah, sorry, questions? I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes. Uh, so yes. in your previous slide, uh, there was no communication because the way you're slicing it, you are taking advantage of the block structure of the underlying multiplications, the matrices, or I, I missed The matrices. Something. So, so the, the, the matrix is usually when you, uh, let me see if, I, if this is correctly. So you multiply like this, right? Uh, let me share my screen. Um, how do I share? Oh, I'm still sharing my screen. Huh, interesting. So if we, uh, so did I, oh, I took away that. Oh, here. So if you matrix multiply things, basically is what you do. You can chop it. In fact, you can still, you can chop it like this and chop it like this. That's what happened in the second diagram. You can chop it however you like, as long as the matrix multiplication rules is being complied, is being obeyed, right? The problem is not the matrix multiplication. The problem is the uh, nonlinearity function, because if you want to apply nonlinear non non function with the chopped matrices, you need to ensure that nonlinear function would, do not need a synchronization point right here. Otherwise, because yeah. you, you think about it, you have a gigantic matrix, you haven't even injected data yet. And if you wanna <laughs> matrix multiplication with the data communication, with the gradient exchange, that's gonna be really, really expensive. Every single time they need to communicate and synchronize with one another, everyone has to wait. Thank you. Yeah, so, so. All right, so I hope that's clear. Otherwise, uh, you know, again, I will put uh, Xian Tao in uh, a, uh, in a breakout room six, just to make sure that we are all on the same page. So for this, again, we do the same thing. 
we multiply them and then we got y1, y2, we chop it horizontally now, b, and we do the same thing. And then we get sum or reduce and then drop out and then we get our z. So now we're done with tensor parallelism. Let's talk about pipeline parallelism. Pi-pi parallelism, chopping it vertically. So literally each and every layer, the uh, okay, so the differences between this is that the communication between pi pi parallelism is cheap, whereas the communication between tensor parallelism is intensive. You need to make sure your GPU have a good performance with large batch sizes. And we're gonna take a look at why afterwards. So if you remember in, um, in yesterday's multi-node training, you have the pipeline parallel size <coughs> and you have the tensor parallel size. <coughs> if you have one DGX, A GPUs, tensor parallelism is enough. You do not need pipeline parallelism. However, yesterday you got two node. Oi, you got two node. So the ideal, in fact, is to have a tensor, uh, a tensor parallelism with two pi pi tensor parallelism. Why? Because you chop your model, you, got, you will see it later on, you actually got two models. Okay, moving on. We're still staying with tensor parallelism because we only got two uh, GPUs and we are not going to do multi-node today. So again, staying with the example we had above, we have two nodes, node zero, node one. We have, uh, the, this is tensor parallelism again. We have, this is the first model, this is the second model. Because they are a copy of each other so that we can, uh, this is the data parallel group one, this is the data parallel group two. So what does this mean? That means that if you want to scale your um, data uh, and your model size across multi-node, as your GPU size grow, as number of GPU grow, you can grow both your model size as well as your data size. And the data size growing is depending on the GPU, restricted by how you chop your model into the nodes. That will allow you to achieve around 93% in that sense, when you have 128 GPUs with model and data parallel. And that's weak scaling. And then as their size grow, you could still retain the percentage of the uh, teraflops that you have achieved. So it's very important to make sure that your model and data parallel with regard to your Megatron configuration is correctly done. And that's what we are going to do in the um, <coughs> lab six with regard to profiling. And you will get um, the uh, uh, EMEA uh, profiling champion helping you out in understanding this. Now we're going to pipelining because now we're going to talk about data. Traditionally in PyTorch, when you injected the data. So this is what you do. You go forward pass, this is forward pass, one, two, three, four. Every, uh, the, the GPU two has to wait on GPU one finished before you go to GPU two and so on and so forth. And then this is back propagation. Now that's very not very efficient. You can see that people are waiting. This is called pipeline bubble, huge pipeline bubble. Now, if your batch size is large, if you can make sure your global batch size is large, you could chop your global batch size to mini, mini batches. We're calling them micro batches. So for example, like this. And you can line them up such as this and you decreased, as you can see, you decrease the pipeline bubble. You can go as far as decrease the pipeline bubble time to this. So there's your equation. So you can even calculate it if you want. So this entirety with the model parallelism by hacking the, uh, tens, um, the transformer layers, the multi-layer percept uh, multi perceptron as well as the self-attention layer plus the data pipelining is what allow you to achieve utilizing up to 3072 
GPUs and train theoretically up to one trillion of parameter GPT-3. So I hope that is clear. I hope that's clear. <laughs> so um, in the lab, what you're going to do, the first thing you're going to do is that you're going to um, go through the initializer pi and understand how the GPU affinity is working. And this is the, uh, so this is how it's, it's going to look like. So basically, if you imagine you don't need a physical GPUs uh, to do that exercise. In fact, that's the reason why you can only do forward, you cannot do backwards because we're now literally sending the data to the GPUs. We're going to do it virtually. So this is what we're going to do. We have, if we assume, imagine that we have 16 GPUs. So that means we have two nodes, like exactly what you have yesterday. We're going to do pipeline parallel four, tensor parallel two. What does this mean? That means that this is your GPU affinity. And that's how initialize the pi allocated. And that's based on the fact that, you know, because inside of each DGX box, you have NVLink. NVLink is GPU to GPU communication that allow you to have high speed bandwidth plus NV switch. NV switch is allow you to all to all GPU communication. So all, all, all GPUs to all GPUs. And in between the, the, the nodes, you have infinite band. So that's the superpower architecture. And Megatron is utilizing all of that because initialize the pie is, is done in such a way that allow you to make sure that those GPU numbers close to one another will utilize the envy link, in fact. So that's the lab, what we're gonna do. Wait, so you, in this case, you actually got two models. This is, this is model zero, this is model one in that sense. I hope that is clear. So what we're going to do, I hope that you guys have finished that. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have to catch up. We have uh, one hour lunch, so we should be able to have time enough to buffer to catch up. Anyhow, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through, uh, no, no, in fact, it should be here. We, should, we are going to go through the lab of Megatron uh, Core MPU, which is lab 1-3. So that's headed to the lab over here. Uh, if you get lost every time, just go to the start here and then go to lab three. And then we can start to, um, we can start to go through the lab. I will put uh, Xian Tao in uh, room six. So Xian Tao, um, when the breakout room starts, please go to room six and then I will take over his part of the teams. Questions? Okay, thank you. So, um, Moscon. All right. Um, I know that uh, it's a, a little bit, um, we're a little bit late, but no problem because, you know, I'm going to stay here until three. And um, yeah. So, what we're going to do now, and hopefully that some of you guys have uh, <laughs> have gone through uh, lab one, three. And um, basically, if, uh, if uh, you went to the, the session where Xian Tao, was in, um, then um, it should become clear so that you actually don't need to go through this lab as, as long as you understand the mechanism because we are going to use this mechanism when we do the profiling. All right, so um, we are a little bit late, uh, so let's haste it up. Uh, did I share my screen? No, I did not. So I'm going to share my screen now. So the next things we're going to do is that we are going to uh, look at, okay, we're going to look at the um, lab four and lab five. So lab four and lab five, uh, let me just go here. What you're going to go through is to understand how uh, GPT-2 tokenizer is made, basically. Uh, we are going to use those libraries from Hugging Face Transformers. And Hugging Face has two things that it's important for us to use. And uh, these, these are things that are just important so, so Jupyter Notebook can, can be allowed having permission to download things. But anywho, if we go through here, you are gonna fetch the original Hugging Face GPT-2 vocab emerge files. We're gonna examine it. And notice again, you have this very strange character. 
What is this character? This character is space plus 256. And it is a control letter. It allow you to um, understand that when something start with a space. So if we look at this, hello world, have a space before, therefore, here you will start have a G. So this is very important in order to preserve this pre, it's called pre-tokenization. Uh, Johan, sorry, can you uh, mute? Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no worries. So the pre-tokenizer is necessary in order for you to train your own tokenizer. So we're going to do two things here in this lab. We are going to first load from transformer library. And then we are going to load it using the uh, GPT-2 uh, vocab merge files, which we obtained just by wget. And we're going to see to it that this tokenizer will, will tokenize like this. And then we're going to use the tokenizer from Hugging Face again. And why we're doing that is because transformer, this transformer library does not allow you to train the tokenizer. It just allow you to, to directly use it because they will, they will actually fetch exactly the same thing in the backend. However, the other library code tokenizers also provided by Hugging Face allow you to train your own tokenizer. But training the tokenizer is very important to actually understand the differences. Otherwise you would train the tokenizer that is not compatible with GPT. So there's another uh, kind of things is that, yeah, okay. So if you want to use the GPT tokenizer, Using the tokenizers library for Hugging Face, you need to make sure you have the pre-tokenizer by level enabled and the encoder by level decoder there. If you don't do this, as you can see, with exactly the same vocab and merge file, and then tokenizer tokenizing exactly the same string, it will result in two different tokenization. That's how important it is to do pre-tokenization. So. That's what this notebook is about. Afterwards, in each and every notebook, when you're done, you can either go next or go home. Go home, we will go back to starter. Go next, you will go to the next notebook. The next notebook will let you understand why MMAP format is important. So if you look at it, this is time it. If you just randomly save a NumPy array, MPY array, if you load it with normal NumPy, this is the time. If you load it with MMAP right here, this is the time. I hope you see the, the, the speed up. <laughs> that is the reason why uh, Negatron, when it comes to the preprocessing pi, require you to convert your data to MMAP format because it's fast loading. So let's get cracked on because that was what we're going to do for uh, from now on to, <laughs> let's say 11.45. And then we're going to, oh, okay, I will give you uh, 20 more minutes. Uh, so, so, uh, okay, let's do 11.50. And afterwards, we are going to do the profiling um, with Robert. Okay, so I, I will. Oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, we do certificate of attendance as well. And also, uh, we also have a little giveaway for everyone uh, along with the certificate of attendance. So you will be contacted by the end of next week by your email and you will receive a certificate of attendance for this event as well as um, some vouchers to use towards a training program. Uh, it's a DLI code, but you will receive also instructions on how to redeem the voucher. And um, thanks for uh, being engaged and uh, participate um, in the uh, event. That's it. Handing over to you, Robert. Yeah, Robert, you cannot you, still uh, see your screen, by the way, Robert. Yeah, yeah, we, we can't. Um, and Robert is the, um, it just briefly, maybe Robert, you can introduce yourself. I briefly introduce you. Maybe you want to do that too. H hello. I think we lost him because uh, I, I also can't see his uh, ca his camera is on, but I cannot see him. 
Uh, Same for me. Yeah. Hmm. Thinking okay. behind the scene. Probably he lost connection somehow. Yeah, um, and I think uh, you need to disable VPN. VPN usually is the, the culprit of this kind of thing. So, yeah. Uh, so before we do that, um, can we do a quick progress check uh, in each and every team? How many of you uh, sent it uh, to the uh, Slack channel? Uh, just uh, do team uh, number and then dash if you finished, uh, what lab number? So if you can, guys can do that so I can have a, a proper check. So I know that next time when I run, when we run this kind of uh, bootcamp, we need to give it, like, like we said, more break time so we can catch up and so on. Cool. So in between when we're waiting for, uh, uh, for Rob, Robert to join. Huh, there's uh, something wrong with this connection. Can you see him back here? Good. And now he's going to join back. He said the um, sound killed the Zoom. <laughs> uh, OK, yeah. Well, let's hope that uh, yeah, he's typing to me just a second. We have a lot of technical issues uh, nowadays. <laughs> Give it a sec. He's typing. Maybe in that case, I, I needed to do the presentation instead. He's joining back now, so. Ah, we have Paul, okay, good. Oh, good. So this is good. And you guys can see the poll, right? Uh, me, me yes. and you can see the, oh, I can, everyone probably oh, can, I see can see the results. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so um, we will have uh, the lunch break and, and after this soon. So if you guys uh, can uh, catch up and try and catch up and sorry about it to actually take over some of your lunch time. We are running a little bit late. Uh, Robert said that he's joining back, so he should be back momentarily. Yes, no, I'm back, so. Good. <laughs> <laughs> sharing my screen and audio kind of killed my ah. my whole system <laughs> no worries uh, wait a second i will share my screen uh, we are running a poll uh, uh, and uh, we we are waiting uh, for all of you guys uh, to participate otherwise uh, we will end the poll in 10 seconds okay so some of you has already moved to lab five, that's good. Um, to, to go through the profiling, you do not, um, we have prepared the backup data. So if it's necessary and you wanted to do the other uh, one, two, three, four labs, uh, you can do it in your um, in other time. I can, I can tell you how to copy over uh, after Robert's presentation, the data you needed in order to run lab six. So. You actually don't need to, if you don't want to, let me know. Uh, so I think we're done. Uh, Moshkan, could you end the poll? And yes, then we... I, I did end the poll. So 20 people responded, some of them about like maybe five or eight. Yeah, so eight out of 20 um, reached lab five. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people finished lab one. 
um, but uh, people, I mean, half of them actually went through the rest of the labs. So still, people cool. are still working on the labs. No worries. Okay, so let me share my screen with the sound. And, and you, you just tell me when I should uh, do yeah. next uh, slide, and then I would do it just a second. So. Oh, this is these are the old slides. These are the old slides. Oh, no, no, now they are on the new ones. Okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. please start. Hmm? Okay, so so my name is, is Robert Dietrich and I'm working in the in the Ansight Systems HPC team. So in this presentation, we are going to give you well a brief introduction to the overall profiling workflow with NVIDIA tools such as Ansight Systems and also a little bit of NVIDIA SMI. And um, you probably got already the answer why we have an extra presentation on profiling. So in general, it's because it's important. So it's important for several reasons. You probably want to get your results as fast as possible. So this is maybe one reason. So it's always good to have an optimized execution, especially in terms of load balancing. But there's also the reason that um, some resource providers, labs, clusters, where you, where you have to prove that your application runs efficiently and also utilizes the resources um, efficiently. So you might get kicked, you might even get kicked off a system if you, if you allocated uh, GPUs and do not effectively use them. So there are a couple of reasons why you should do profiling, profile your execution runs. So what you see here on, on this slide um, in the box on the top is the typical profiling workflow. So you might have seen this uh, in a similar fashion before. So it usually starts with an application profile, which is super easy to generate with Ansight systems. And then it is you who inspects and analyzes the profile to make the right conclusions and will eventually optimize um, the execution. So, an so such an optimization does not necessarily be a change in the code. Well, it can also simply be a different number as an input parameter, for example. So. Yeah, the right choice of info input parameters is, is especially in this workshop, um, um, the ones that you're going for. So the, the box below then represents um, the so-called NCG containers, container images, which are provided by NVIDIA. Um, I just put the PyTorch and the TensorFlow containers in here as representatives, since those are the relevant ones for deep learning applications. Um, they provide an environment with pre-installed and, and pre-configured software to start right away without requiring you to do lots of administrative tasks, such as installing your, your software that you need. So this is a pretty easy way to, to have a pretty good and well set up environment to start with. And as you know, NVIDIA also provides a lot of libraries and frameworks to simplify and support programming. Um, yeah, to finally kind of use the NVIDIA GPUs. Um, you could also put, um, well, maybe Megatron in, in the left box here on, um, um, yeah, in, in the left box here. And um, Megatron uses, for example, Kublas, it uses Nickel. And obviously all those libraries and frameworks use CUDA, um, well, as the um, interface to, to CUDA enabled, um, well, and yeah, CUDA enabled GPUs. All right, and the box on the bottom here, it, it just lists some NVIDIA hardware and partners. So maybe move to the next slide, please. All right, so um, NVIDIA profiling for computational task circles around the profiling tool and site systems, which is in the middle here in this box. So for deep learning, there's also an additional tool, which we call DLProf and it provides some high level information on the deep learning um, features of the execution and also gives you some su suggestions for improvements. For example, um, how, how well are your tensor cores used? How well, how much computation, how much communication is in your, in your GPU usage? Uh, all right. Um, um, in general, DLProf is just um, a layer on top of Ansight Systems. So Ansight Systems captures the data and um, DLProf then reads the report and generates their own reports. To um, refine your, your own program execution, you can then add um, 
something like, uh, or we call it NVTX annotations, which is like a manual instrumentation layer you can put into your program. And it's pretty easy. You can just take a, well, function calls and add markers. So to mark a specific point in time in your execution, or you can surround a code region with an NVTX range, push pop. And then you can see finally in the report when you visualize it, that's um, on the bottom here uh, on the slide, you can see the ranges that you kind of marked or that you wanted to highlight to see how long that took in your execution and also what else is related to this specific range can be seen then in inside systems. There are a whole bunch of other NVIDIA profiling tools that are not so important here for, for this workshop. So there's also Insight Graphics for graphics applications analysis, and there's Insight Compute for a very detailed CUDA kernel performance analysis. But this is something which you um, uh, do not need for, for the workshop because you are probably do not want to optimize Megatron yourself. So no need to, to go a, a low level in that part here. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you created your profile, which is, as I said, pretty pretty easy to do with, um, with Insight Systems and open it in the Insight Systems GUI, this is uh, what you will see when you, yeah, when you open it or at least something, something similar to this one here. So this timeline view shows the dynamic runtime behavior of your program. What you see on the left here, you see, um, well, several rows that we should represent how the application is interacting with, um, well, various system resources over the course of the lifetime of the application. So in this case here, we can see that the Python program uses TensorFlow, which itself then uses QDNN, so the QDNN library, and as usual, as the lowest level, um, the CUDA um, well, runtime or driver API to communicate with a GPU. Um, yeah, um, next to, to these features, which you see here on the left, um, next to these libraries, there is a growing number of tracing features that we are supporting. So next to QBLAS and QDNN, TensorFlow, we also support um, QSPARS, OpenACC, OpenMP, MPI, OpenSchmem, UCX, and well, as I said, a whole bunch of other features um, for GPU and also CPU analysis. So we do not want to go over these individual bubbles because um, well, time time is not enough to to well talk about each of the features. But there is really a lot of detailed information that you can get out from such a profile to finally figure out um, well spots in your application that are worth to to optimize. What you will first want to focus on if you have your profile open are the, the rows that start with um, CUDA hardware and then a strange number, which uh, usually ref reflects the PCI Express port and the, the, the NVIDIA GPUs are plugged in. So you probably want to look at them. They have this um, blue color histogram view, which tells you um, how much your GPU is active or is utilized. So the blue color here, the blue histogram will show you the CUDA kernel coverage. And there are also some red bubbles below. It's tough to see here on the screen, but the red points kind of, and the, and the green points on below, they tell you um, the average number of memory operations. So you can easily spot with this one line, how well your GPU is utilized and um, how many memory operations are done there. So it's pretty easy to, to identify cold and hot spots in terms of GPU usage. You have a similar thing with um, the lines which are called Python here, which are executed on the CPU. So you have the, the black histograms for CPU utilization and a bunch of other information in the rows below about the uh, thread state and um, core usage, um, samples which are taken on the GPU uh, and other things like the OS runtime library calls. So there are a lot more information which might not be necessarily interesting for you um, for a first glance, but for a final optimization, this is also important to optimize the CPU part a little bit. All right, so let's move to the next slide. Um, yeah, some of um, inside, some of the inside system features, such as the CPU and the GPU sampling, they require additional permissions. 
So if you're running a container and you want to enable, um, you, you, you probably want to enable the sysadmin capability to also enable these features. And finally, you then can use this inside status um, dash e command to check whether um, the sampling support is enabled or not. So this is not required for most features, but for sampling features, you might want to add this flag if you start your Docker container, for example. Um, yeah, exactly. Let's move to the next slide. So for small and medium Megatron runs, you can stay on a single node and there, and then you can start profiling there with inside systems and but also to get a, get a get an overview on the execution, you could also start with NVIDIA SMI to get some coarse grained um, um, information on the uh, on the GPU utilization. So what you need to do is um, you need to maybe if you if you have a batch system such as Slurm, you maybe need to create an interactive um, session, and then use Screen or Tmax to to duplicate um, your console. On the one you would like, uh, you would probably start your application, and on the other one you could um, start a command, which is written here on the top right. So, each second watch the NVIDIA SMI output, which then tells you, um, well, the GPU utilization in percent. Just to give you a high-level overview on what's happening on the GPU, it also gives you the power consumption of the GPU, which somehow tells you how effective or how efficiently you really use your GPU um, compute resources and also the memory usage. So what you can see in general, you can see in general, is my execution somehow balanced? So overall GPU, so if one GPU is only a high utilization, but you have been using four and they are almost idling, then yeah, you probably did something wrong in the with your parameters. So this, this, this all gives you a high level information on, on how well your execution is balanced and how well you utilize your, your GPUs. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, you guys can all see my uh, cursor, right? Yep. Cursor, yes. So basically um, this um, in the Jupyter Lab environment, you do not need uh, the TMIX. You can in fact just uh, go to uh, open a, a new terminal and drag the terminal here then like you have a double screen, you will also see this particular uh, video recording on how to actually do that as in to have this dual screen uh, in the JupyterLab environment. Yeah, I just wanna add that, so yeah, moving on. Yeah, let's move to the next slide then. Okay, um, to, to get this um, more detailed picture on the execution of your application, you can then use inside systems. And what you just have to do is you just have to prefix the first two words. So it would be enough to say ENSYS profile and then append Python dash M torch distributed and blah, blah, blah. So this would be enough, but there are a whole bunch of parameters that you can add um, to kind of, well, yeah, better configure your profiling session. So here, what we did is we said dash dash delay. So delay the profiling for 10 seconds, do the profiling only for 300 seconds um, in total. Do not kill the application when profiling ends. And um, well, use the tracing features for CUDA, QBLAS and NVTX. Also track our CUDA memory usage and specify, uh, specify an output file and override it if it exists. So this is what, what the line here says. And the, the bottom box here just is the normal um, Megatron training run launch. So this is what you just prefix before your execution. And then finally, uh, a profile report would dro drop out at the end of the execution. Okay, um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, that's that's a video. So the, this is the uh, the demo of uh, how you call out uh, Insight. So uh, tell me if you can hear the sound. Um, Mojgan, tell me if you can hear the sound, okay? Okay, so can you hear the sound? Yeah, yes. we can. Good, okay. Okay, so. Eh? Whether uh, you already have the global installed uh, available for all users um, inside a system, user interface installed, 
or you have installed it manually like I did here. Uh, the most important thing is that you know how to call out Nsight. And I have installed Nsight here. So the only thing I need to do is to point it to that particular um, directory and call out my Nsight UI here. And then I should start to see my Nsight. Right. So in order to uh, take a look at uh, let's remove this. So if you have already uh, run and saved your profiling uh, file successfully, you should be able to open it like this. Mine is at uh, project guest at N uh, NSC users, ZCharp, GPU bootcamp, AI Megatron English Python profiles. So here I have saved a bunch of profiling runs. Let's open one of them. OK, so now I have make it bigger, and then it's finished loading. And as you can see, Basically, I have tagged Megatron to have these different phases. Uh, one is initialize, data loading, the actual training, and checkpoint saving. So obviously, since this is a naive run, so uh, it is not utilized uh, GPU that well. And for uh, the day two's exercise, you will be using two GPUs. So you should see two of these. Um, if we go down, you will see the second one over here. And again, tagged like this. This is a second GPU. And um, uh, basically, uh, if you, uh, you will see this a lot. If you are doing checkpointing rather oftenly, you are going to um, uh, see a lot of this uh, CUDA device synchronization. So you might want to consider um, doing checkpointing uh, not at every epoch or every iterations, but rather in the uh, appropriate frequency. So that's how you call out Insight on Bezerus and um, monitoring the performance of your training run. So, <clears throat> so okay, you, yeah. So you can also, uh, uh, on the on the terminal, you can also say ansys dash ui and then the path to the report file to directly open the report file. So you do not need to go over the file open dialog if you want to just open one profile directly. Exactly. And shall we run through this one as well so that people know how to actually uh, go out dub, uh, do, do double screen? Robert, is it okay? Yeah, of course. OK, so let's first um, open up and have a look of this profile naive run. Um, we have our usual NCS decoration, followed by the uh, Megatron normal job launching run. Previously, we have obtained those um, files. We have our toy data um, obtained via web scraping. We have the vocab and merge file. <clears throat> and now we're going to um, write out the profile after the profiling run to this directory. So before we do that, let's call out, since we want to do live monitoring, let's call out a terminal, uh, make it. So this is how you arrange to have two uh, windows inside of Jupyter Notebook. We do watch minus N1 NVIDIA SMI. So this will allow you to, as you can see, it will update every uh, every second or every two seconds. Um, so uh, it's every second, by the way. So if we have a look over here, let's launch the training run. It's very important to know how Megatron uh, is initializing and before it gets to the training phase, because we are going to monitor uh, the initialization, the data loading, as well as the training and the checkpointing. So 
And here is a, is a printout from N site. It is collecting the data. And as you can see, when it's initializing, there's no movement. Okay, so now that we started to have uh, the in, uh, in initialized Megatron, Okay, so now that uh, Megatron start to print out all these parameters of the training configuration we have, and after the initialization over here, we have data indexing, uh, data being loading, and then the uh, computation of the, the GPD data set, and then we're ready for training. Now we're doing the training. You should see um, this picked up, the GPU utilization, as well as the power pick up a bit, So this is the um, bad uh, training naive run. Uh, we deliberately make it so, so uh, the training run looks bad. Basically what we would like to see is not only the GPU utilization is high, we would like to see the power is as high, uh, as close to the max as possible. That would indicate that uh, we will have good uh, tensor core usage. So that's something to think about so that we understand that we wanted to um, improve on our uh, uh, training run in order to fill up the GPU memory. So as you can see, this is not even half of the memory. And this is now doing checkpointing. As you can see, when it's doing checkpointing, this suddenly become 100, but this is not really using the tensor core because you see the power consumption is low. So now, uh, uh, the uh, end site is processing the event is, and then it's going to save to a uh, profile which we can read on the uh, NSYST uh, user interface. Okay, now, okay, so, uh, sorry. So, yep. Robert, would you like yep. to, yeah. Okay, so this, this here is just a static picture, so a static screenshot of what, what you will see with the Insight um, um, system SCUI for the, uh, well, naive run, so which is not optimized. And what you basically see here that you have a very low GPU utilization during the training run, which you probably do not want to have on all the GPUs. Um, as I said, you see a whole bunch of additional information, which in that part here might not be interesting for you, um, because you probably first want to start put more load on the GPU and then go to the more fine-grained parts um, on, on, on the information which are available down here. So let's let's move to the next slide um, where we can easily spot on a first glance in this CUDA hardware row that each of them is having a lot more GPU utilization. Um, Yes, and then you, you to, to further optimize it, then you can go through all the other rows and then figure out and um, which parts could well be further optimized at that point. If you are more interested on, on the CPU side and want to optimize these, then you have to go to the, the Python rows here. So where you have the CPU utilization, but these parts are, well, you can check the on, on the top left, the CPU, course and, and check how much they are utilized each of the each of them but for megatron it's really the main focus on putting load on the gpu um, and well get them running so they can compute the results um yes further information are for example that you megatron uses nickel which is the nvidia collectives library so um this this row gives you a little bit more information on the um, communication between the GPUs if multiple GPUs are used. Um, the NVTX row here, there's this um, double, well, this arrow which goes in both directions next to the label. If you click on it, then it kind of will open up um, and show you all the NVTX markers. So it's not just this line, it is a lot more. So you can kind of expand this here. And well, 
as I said, you can basically try try it out yourself, and it should be pretty intuitive. If you click on one of the lines, you will see um, that it gets highlighted in a cyan color, and everything else, which is also related to the range that you clicked on, will also get highlighted. So you can also see what's happening on the GPU when you click on one of the um, ranges on on the CPU side. So, yep. And, and I think you should should really try it out yourself. Um, I hope it's intuitive. And if there are further questions, feel free to ask um, on Slack or, yeah. Um. So um, he, he, we can, uh, in fact, um, go through uh, the, the multi node, but I, I think it's not necessary. If you guys are interested, I will uh, publish this um, to the lecture materials. If you guys have any question about profiling right now, you can ask, uh, you can ask Robert directly, uh, staying in the main room, or that if you are ready, we can uh, go to the breakout room instead and then start crack on with the um, uh, with the lab six. Uh, for those of you who wanted to go directly, uh, what happened to my, uh, it got killed. Okay, so it's probably good for you guys to know that, you know, it's uh, three hours in general uh, for the Jupiter lab. I, I, I don't know if I have told you guys that when you do the interactive round, the default is three hours. So like this, I'm already gone. I need to re restart the entire thing. Um, but in any cases, if you, um, have already gotten it, you should have the data in in the data set. Uh, oh, I have to uh, guest user Z. Uh, you should have uh, in the data set uh, of the day two, um, day two data as well. Otherwise, uh, let me know. I will jump into the, if you want to go to lab six directly, you don't want to go through one, two, three, four, five, then tell me, I will I will uh, give you that data. Uh, it's already in, embedded in the asset tar. It should have day two marker in it, day two data set. You just need to copy over those data into the data set directly underneath GPU bootcamp. Uh, GPU bootcamp. Bootcamp AI Megatron uh, data. Jupiter. Oh, English Python <laughs> Jupiter in the data set. You should have that. So if you don't have this, let me know. I will uh, give you the data. So if you want to jump in directly into that, you can do that. Okay? So uh, if you have question now, ask, or that we can open the breakout room. And then I would ask uh, Robert to jump in the breakout room when you guys have the question. Cool? Uh, 